You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. For any new listeners on this podcast, we talk about all kinds of things related to lighthouses, history, preservation, movies, books, technology, really everything related to lighthouses. My co-host is once again Michelle Jewell Shaw, lighthouse volunteer, teacher, photographer, and mom. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. This is episode 83 of Lighthearted, slated for October 5th, 2020. On October 5th, 1817, West Chop Lighthouse on Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, was first lighted. And on October 5th, 2002, Aya Lamotte Lighthouse on Lake Champlain in Vermont returned to service after nearly 70 years in darkness. On October 5, 1951, the American actress Karen Allen, star of such movies as Raiders of the Lost Ark and Starman, was born. She once said, and I quote, I want every day of life to be wonderful, fascinating, interesting, creative, and what am I going to do to make that happen? End quote. Well, life is what you make it, I guess. It sure is. So where are we going today, Jeremy? We are heading down the New England coast, almost to New York City. Our subject today is Green's Ledge Lighthouse in Norwalk, Connecticut, and we'll be talking with the father and son team that's uh, very involved in its preservation. Michelle, please help me tell our listeners about Green's Ledge Lighthouse and our guests. Sure, Jeremy. Green's Ledge is one of several treacherous formations near Norwalk Harbor in Connecticut. Congress appropriated $60,000 for the establishment of a light and fog signal at Green's Ledge in 1899, and the 52-foot lighthouse was finished in 1902. Green's Ledge is a cast iron tower on a cylindrical cast iron concrete filled foundation, typical of offshore spark plug lights built in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Male keepers lived inside the lighthouse tower. The most harrowing story in the history of the light station happened in 1910. On March 2nd, Principal Keeper John Kiarskin left the lighthouse in the station's only boat, telling Assistant Keeper Leroy C. Lowborough that he was going to Norwalk to pick up provisions and both men's paychecks. He never returned. Eleven days later, the lighthouse tender Pansy landed at Green's Ledge and found Lowborough half-starved, exhausted, and almost crazy according to an article in the Washington Post. Lowborough told authorities that during the time he was abandoned, he lived on potatoes and dog biscuits with only boiled salt water to drink. When the tender crew arrived to investigate the extinguished light, the assistant keeper was found on the floor, almost unconscious, and with his dog at his side. Lowborough later said that he would have shared his last biscuit with the dog. Quote, I feel 10 years older and my hair has grown gray, said Lowborough after being taken ashore. He received high praise for his heroism in the face of abandonment and possible starvation. It turned out that Kiarskin had gone to a local hotel where he cashed Lowborough's check for $44.69 and went on a drinking binge. He eventually gave himself up to Bridgeport Police and he was immediately discharged as keeper. Over the years, especially after the hurricane of September 1938, Green's ledge light developed a tilt and the keepers complained that the vibrations from the station's generators caused all the furniture to move to one side of the tower. They solved the problem by only having furniture on one side. The lighthouse was automated in 1972 and the Fresnel lens was replaced by a modern rotating optic. The tower has been altered a great deal. The lower gallery roof and original iron railings and stanchions have been removed. The light remains an active aid to navigation. Under the provisions of the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act, the lighthouse was auctioned in 2016. The high bid was placed by a group of local residents that included Tim Petty, Alex Petty, Brendan McGee, and Shannon Holloway. They formed a 501c3 organization, the Greens Ledge Light Preservation Society. The acquisition of the lighthouse was made through a founding donation by the Petty family. The Greens Ledge Light Preservation Society launched a fundraising campaign that's raised over $1.7 million through private donations for restoration. 
Upon completion of registration, the Greens Ledge Light Preservation Society plans to host educational tours and plans have been developed for improved boat access. The lighthouse has been repainted this year and new windows were installed, replacing plastic windows installed by the Coast Guard. There are plans to install green off-the-grid energy and plumbing systems, featuring a desalinization and water treatment plant and solar power. Tim Petty, who is president of Greens Ledge Light Preservation Society, grew up in Westport, Connecticut. He raised four children with his wife Sheila in New Canaan and has been a resident of Rowayton, Connecticut since 2014. In addition to his work with Greens Ledge Lighthouse, Tim is on the board and chair of the finance committee for the Maritime Aquarium in Norwalk. When he's not at the lighthouse, Tim is chief investment officer of AIG Sun America Asset Management. Tim Petty's son, Alex Petty, is the founder and president of Hoya Capital Real Estate in Connecticut, and he's treasurer of the Greens Ledge Light Preservation Society. I had the pleasure of speaking with Tim Petty and Alex Petty in late August. Let's listen to that conversation now. I am speaking today with Tim Petty, the president of the Greens Ledge Light Preservation Society, and Alex Petty, who is the treasurer of the society. Thank you so much for joining me today, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Let's talk about the lighthouse. And I'd just like to start, before we get into the preservation, I'd like to start with a little bit of early history. Can either of you tell me how Greens Ledge Lighthouse got its name? This area of coastal Connecticut in the 17, 1800s was a, was a really bustling seaport community and a lot, of, a lot of commerce from New York City. And with that came kind of less desirables shall we say, and the legend is that the light is named after uh, a privateer, basically somebody that preyed upon the, the robust shipping in this area in the 17 and 1800s. And uh, I think he met a untimely demise uh, in, the, in the Norwalk Islands, uh, which, uh, which the light protects, if you will, and somehow the ledge off of those islands got, some people call him a pirate, uh, I'll call him a privateer. Um, and so the ledge on which the Greens Ledge Lighthouse sits was named after that privateer. And I, I think I remember hearing the green uh, pirate or privateer actually sailed with Captain Kidd. Uh, oh, I don't know right. if that's, that may be. Well, that's part, that's part, of, part of the legend. Which yeah. we, uh, we're still trying to fact check that one. Captain Kidd seems to figure in a lot of legends. So uh, anybody listening, we're not guaranteeing that this is, uh, that's entirely a, a true story, but it's a, it's a great <laughs> origin of the, the name. So what was the reason for the establishment of Greens Ledge Lighthouse in 1902? Yes, the lighthouse actually replaced uh, Sheffield Island Light, uh, which I believe was uh, mid-1800s. And so they, they decommissioned Sheffield Light and in the process built Greens Ledge. Started in 1901, I, I believe it was activated in the summer of 1902. And I believe it was manned until 1972. And then it was, it was automated then, it's still a uh, active uh, aid. It's a, uh, uh, for your listeners benefit, it's a spark plug. It's one of the 40 some odd uh, spark plug varieties that were built I think in the late 1800s and early 1900s and sits a mile offshore and about a mile from Sheffield Light, as Alex mentioned. I've been on Sheffield Island a few times. The Norwalk Seaport Association runs boat tours there and you see Green's Ledge Light well on uh, the ride out there and from Sheffield Island, as you mentioned. So Green's Ledge is certainly one I've been familiar with for, for quite a few years. Uh, so the two of you are, are part of a, a group of people that bought the lighthouse at auction in 2016. What made you decide to buy a lighthouse? Well, Jeremy, the, uh, we're lifelong residents of this area. I've sailed and, you know, been in Long Island Sound waters, you know, since I was a kid. And and bringing up my family, we did the same, either sail or power. And uh, one day we were out by Green's Ledge and Alex uh, was with me. And my daughter said uh, that, you know, of course, her, 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 she was buried in her phone, you know, even offshore. 
And she said, Dad, Green's Ledge is for sale. And I said, well, gee, I, 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 don't, I didn't think they sold those things. I, that's, that sounds very unusual. And of course, she wanted to buy it. And Alex was encouraging as, as well. And uh, so we looked into it. We registered for the GSA auction in uh, August of 2016. Uh, Alex started doing a lot of research uh, on, on Green's Ledge, on spark plugs, and on lights. And uh, lo and behold, to our surprise, we won the auction <laughs> in August of 2016. And Jeremy, I say that because there were other auctions uh, going on at the same time, including the Hex um, uh, uh, Ledge was was re was around that same time. There was also Southwest Ledge was uh, also kind of in that same time frame. And the Penfield uh, light was being auctioned around the same time, and and that uh, was getting very spirited bidding. And as I say, I was surprised that we won Green's Ledge. There were only a few bidders, and um, you know our winning bid was such that the GSA came back to us and said, gee, you know, that's not the, uh, the price we had in mind. Can you up your bid? And of course we did. Uh, and we became the, um, you know, the designees, the, the proud owners of Green's Ledge. And uh, we shortly after that, maybe jumping ahead, Jeremy, we teamed up with one of the other bidders, uh, a local restaurateur by the name of Brendan McGee, and Brendan was trying to have the city acquire the light from GSA under the program where, where GSA does, uh, does do, so, do that. Uh, the city wasn't interested. Uh, Brendan had done a lot of work and it seemed uh, a great partnership and has been a great partnership. So we got together and uh, we formed a nonprofit called the Green Sledge Light Preservation Society and uh, the Petty family donated the light to that nonprofit. And, uh, and since then, we've been off and running with, a, with a, what we believe is a really going to be an epic restoration. Oh, it certainly is. Uh, what you've accomplished so far is incredible. And uh, I want to talk more about that and what you have in mind for the future. So when you uh, bought the lighthouse, uh, I'm sure it took a while for all the paperwork to go through and everything it always does with these, uh, these lighthouses that are auctioned. But what kind of condition was the lighthouse in when you bought it? Yeah, so um, it's actually listed you know, on the National Register of, of Historic Places. And it, it was actually listed as in poor, poor condition, um, which was actually below most other auction lighthouses. Uh, Hex Ledge was, uh, you know, listed as in fair condition. Yeah, so it was it was listed as in as in poor condition, and like this was um, a couple years after what was really the the closest cousin to to Green's Ledge, which was uh, Old Orchard Light uh, in, in Staten Island, that actually came down during Hurricane Sandy. It was most similar to to Green's Ledge in its in its structure. I think it was built, I think one year earlier, I think it was, it was literally like the same construction team. It was the same, the same blueprints. And so, you know, I think that that fact kind of spooked a lot of potential buyers, you know, the fact that it, that, that, you know, it's closest comp kind of recently came down. And so, yeah, so it, it wasn't, it wasn't in, in great condition. It was, uh, you know, there, there are major issues with the, the lower caisson area our kind of target was was to kind of in the first couple of years to really kind of try to tackle those major uh, those major issues to that that lower caisson portion. And I understand there were some emergency repairs that were carried out related to that caisson. Is that right? Yeah. So the the, the first two years of the restoration were really uh, really kind of focused on on that kind of lower base portion. The lighthouse, when it was built, there, there, there was there was no there was no riprap there. So for, for the first thirty five years, it was it was uh, it was just the, the the lighthouse itself. And I think that the bulk of kind of the structural damage actually came mostly from from ice, and that there was a there was a terrible winter in the nineteen thirties that prompted uh, the installation of that riprap, uh, which actually came from I believe Radio City during the during the um, the building of Radio City that they transported the rip wrap, you know, from from New York City, and it, it's now it's now those those rocks. 
outside the uh, lighthouse. And so the riprap kind of limits it how, how much, how deep you can really go in the caisson restoration. But we kind of went as, as deep down as, as we could, uh, you know, in that, in that caisson. And yeah, there was extensive uh, kind of metal, metal repair work done. It, it included, you know, um, welding kind of new stainless steel plates and bands. And so, yeah, so that, that really was the, the kind of bulk of, of, of that kind of stabilization process, which was kind of the first, uh, the first two years of the restoration. I know that's pretty typical of these spar plug or caisson type lighthouses, the cast iron, the cast iron caissons. They, the caisson tends to be the first part of the lighthouse to go. That's happened with quite a few of them. They, they get so rusty, the metal plates start to pull apart and that type of thing. So uh, what you're describing is something I've heard about with other similar lighthouses too. You created a fundraising campaign that's raised more than $1.7 million. Is that an accurate figure at this time? I think that is an accurate figure as of, uh, as of today, 1.7, yeah. Okay, that's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh, has that been mostly through local donations? Uh, how, how have you raised so much money? It's re- really impressive. It's, uh, I'd say 98% of it is, is local. There's, there's a, a few donors, you know, not from the Connecticut area, you know, who are dedicated preservationists, obviously. But we are, we're really blessed in this community with not only preservationists, um, you know, who have, who have actively donated, but the community has responded. And Alex and I uh, created that, uh, that campaign, a keeper's campaign, if you will. We felt some urgency, Jeremy, to and conveyed that urgency to the community. And, uh, and, and that was on the heels of Old Orchard coming down because we, we really, as stewards, you know, once we won the auction and we created the, the uh, society, we were just, we were not going to let it come down. So job one was to prevent it from falling, from, you know, keeping it standing, uh, because otherwise it would have been a blight on the community. It would have reflected poorly on Darien and Norwalk and, and the little, little village of Rowayton, you know, where we are. So uh, we reached out to the shorefront homeowners, you know, who frankly had the most to lose. They would lose their view, their beautiful view of this uh, light that's a mile offshore and um, and so we and we got a very uh, I, I think in the first go by the end of 2017 when we started fundraising by reaching out to those shorefront homeowners uh, I think we had about a million dollars circle you know either donated or pledged and these were people that were you know preservationists obviously interested in the well-being of Long Island Sound and the light. And we did say to those significant donors in 2017, and we've said to the significant donors, you know, that you are, you are restoring, you are preserving this, this icon. And for that, you know, we'll see that you, you, you can have some form of access and, and people responded to that, but it's really been preservationists and restoration. People are interested in the restoration of the, of the light. And it's, but we're, we are blessed to be in a community that has resources, you know, quite frankly, and they responded. And we were very gratified by that, uh, by that response. Well, you should be. The, it's great to have uh, members of the community here who are so, so concerned about their local history. That's great to hear. And you, uh, as I said, you've raised about $1.7 million, but what is your ultimate fundraising goal? Do you have a, a number in mind that for a full restoration of the lighthouse? Well, uh, we think the, uh, the, the restoration itself will be $1.8 million, you know, the costs. However, we want to endow the light. We want to see that when we're done with the work and the last painter or welder leaves uh, the riprap, uh, that the light has some capital for ongoing operations, which should be very minimal. You know, it's not going to be manned. Nobody's going to be living there. Um, but, you know, there are, there, there are ongoing costs, whether it be insurance or painting, 
And so we are aiming to raise $2 million in total, and that will endow the light, we think, for many years uh, after the construction is done. So right now, we're in kind of our last, our last push, you know, the push to get over the top, to push the, to finish the restoration. And, and in the process, if we can get to 2 million, there'll be uh, a, a pretty much a guaranteed future that the light will continue to reflect positively on the community. Uh, on your organization's website, it talks about the, quote, next 100 years, unquote, vision for the lighthouse. What exactly is that vision for the next 100 years? Yeah, so the, the kind of overall kind of fundraising model was was to kind of prevent what we saw kind of happen with, with other kind of restorations and that you kind of restore it once, you know, you have this big drive, it's a big campaign, you restore it once. And then, you know, it, it stops being used and, and, and then it kind of falls back in, in that kind of same cycle. And it kind of it kind of pushes that, it kind of kind of fuels just just that cycle. And so kind of our, our thinking was that to kind of make it, to kind of break that cycle uh, and kind of keep it in, you know, in, in really good condition, you know, it, it needs to be functional. It kind of needs to be, be this kind of community asset. And so yeah, so this this kind of uh, next hundred years is kind of the the kind of the kind of programming of our of our org, and it, it includes having the light be be a kind of active participant, kind of in the community, hosting local community things, whether it's a swim or a or a sail race, and and other kind of educational uh, you know tours. What are the goals as far as public access? Well, the, uh, the, the light as it uh, stands today is somewhat inhospitable and not an, easy, not an easy climb, as you're probably familiar and your listeners are familiar to these type of structures. It's a ladder. There is currently not a dock. So you have to kind of nuzzle up to a ladder and then almost like a submarine get, you know, to get up to the light. So we do envision, in fact, we hope to start work on a dock that we have been permitted for. And that dock will be large enough to accommodate a large uh, boat. We, we are in talks with the Maritime Aquarium of Norwalk, which is about two or three miles away. And they do lighthouse tours on their, um, on their vessel, uh, Spirit of the Sound. None of their tours uh, include visits, you know, inside. They basically just circle the many lights of uh, Long Island Sound. They go down to Throg's Neck and they go up, um, you know, up past New Haven. So we're hoping to offer, you know, their customers, their audience, an opportunity to land at Greens Ledge and, and visit the tower. And, and so the public access will be, we, we, we hope, we don't have an agreement yet, but we'll get there through the Maritime Aquarium. You know, it's, um, as I said, uh, it's not totally hospitable, you know, right now with riprap and a ladder. And in fact, you know, it is not a public park, uh, right? So the public access will be uh, either through the Maritime Aquarium or another agency uh, that will, will do that for us. We want to be, ten, you know, keepers of the light. And, and not be in kind of the ferry business or the shuttle business. And, that's, and there are several good local um, providers of Long Island Sound uh, seaborne visits. Maritime's just one of them. Seaport Association's another one. And we're going to team up with one of them to provide that, that limited public access. But there will be public access, to be sure. That sounds great. And the partnership with the Maritime Aquarium sounds ideal really. Yes. Uh, in the past, I don't know if you know, I've actually narrated some of those cruises for them, the lighthouse cruises. When they first started them, I did the first few. Oh, I haven't good. been back in a couple of years now, but when they start stopping at Greens Ledge Lighthouse, I hope they invite me back to be part of that. I want. I'll, ma I'll make sure of it, Jeremy. <laughs> I, would, I would love that so much. I'm a few hours away from you, but I can make the trip down there. It'll be worth it. Absolutely. Tell me about the electric and plumbing systems and I'm not quite sure where that stands right now. Have the new electric and plumbing systems been installed or is that in the process of happening or what's, what's going on with that? So the kind of systems planning and, and, and installation is actually just, just starting now. The crew was, was just down for a few days last week 
and they're coming down uh, to really begin work next week. And what we're really looking to do is kind of restore the essential kind of systems, you know, that, that were, you know, so critical for that manned lighthouse experience, you know, from 1902 to 1972. And so it, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a very similar plumbing system. It, it's, it's pretty basic, pretty basic kind of power system, but, you know, all, all fueled by, by all, all solar power now, right? So it, it was historically fueled at one, point, at one point by oil and then it was coal. And so, yeah, we're kind of looking to kind of revive those kind of living systems, which we, which we kind of see as kind of a, a critical part of, of, the, of the restoration of, you know, it, it is a, a lighthouse. And so kind of those living systems really are uh, kind of a, a critical part of that restoration. We've contracted with Northeast Marine out of um, the uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts area. Jeremy, maybe you are familiar with them. They were very involved in the Graves Light restoration work uh, that, that was done several years ago and done so well. Very capable group. Uh, we're looking forward to perhaps uh, concluding not only the electrical, but then the plumbing right? Because the, the light, the light keepers obviously had plumbing. And we're hoping we might be able to get that done by the end of the year. That's fantastic. Yeah, based on the work that's been done at, at Graves Light in that area, uh, you guys are, you know, you've chosen the right, right company to work with on that. That's good to hear. So I know some other work has happened fairly recently. The lighthouse has been repainted and new windows installed. Is that correct? Maybe you can tell me a little bit more about what, what has taken place uh, so far restoration wise. In terms of this year, yeah, the major projects were uh, paint and windows. The, the windows were actually ordered, I think two years ago, but, but yeah, so the, like the, the windows did, did require a lot of uh, installation work, lots of metal work, lots of grinding. There's uh, six or eight new brass porthole windows there's, I believe, nine rectangular stainless steel windows. And then, it, yeah, the, the paint was done inside and outside. So that, that included the lead paint um, issues, which were, um, it, it, was, it was kind of covered with, you know, with this, this peeling lead paint. And so, yeah, it, it really cleaned up quickly on, on the inside. And so it was, yeah, it was inside and outside paint. The outside paint started uh, in, in June. It wrapped up in, in around uh, uh, August. Well, I would just note that the windows were manufactured by Cornell Carr. They're nearby in Shelton, Connecticut, and they do a lot of work for the Navy. And these, uh, you know, the Coast Guard had the, the tower sealed up in multiple layers of plastic. Uh, and, and the tower really hadn't breathed for we don't know how many years. Uh, you know, it would be one thing to open the doors up top and down below. But once those windows got in and, and we were able to, you know, have fresh air course through the structure, it really, it really did a lot. And of course that happened uh, after we had uh, stripped and painted the interior. Uh, we did do a, uh, you know, a two code remediation of the, uh, of the lead paint. It was taken down and, and bagged and disposed of properly. Wasn't a lot of it, but uh, nonetheless, that, that was an important consideration, you know, and that is, you know, in any restoration, uh, lead paint, and there were trace amounts of asbestos as well that had to be addressed. But we did that early, and uh, the exterior, we did a, uh, we, we did a, a contest in term online where people could vote for the color that they wanted. Uh, now, the color was to be red, so we posted various shades of red. Uh, I forget what the other ones were. It was like Nantucket red and Hilton head red. There were all sorts of different reds, right? The yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, like the lighthouse, you know, it, it's been, it's been repainted and repainted here, you know, and it was common for, uh, for keepers, you know, early 1900s. I think that, uh, yeah, it wasn't uncommon that, that, that they kind of had, had some say in what, what the, what, what the kind of shading was. And the ultimate shading choice was consistent with, with the, the, you know, the early 1900s shading, which was more of a, of a true red. It, it had kind of gotten darker and darker and darker, especially post-automation, post-1970. It, it seems that the, 
that it, it was dark because it, it didn't have to be painted as, as often. And so as part of the kind of restoration, uh, you know, to, to bring it back to more of the original kind of true red shading seemed, you know, seemed to be kind of, kind of really consistent with the, with the overall kind of, kind of restoration. For those uh, lighthouse enthusiasts on the podcast, the actual color was a Pittsburgh paint and it had the funny name of red gumball. Um, but, and it was very close to kind of a typical red Coast Guard buoy. And, you know, we did use the, uh, there were a lot of paintings, you know, early 1900s postcards, you know, that, that depicted this beautiful red but then, as Alex said, you know, later years, and particularly, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, it was kind of a brown, a red brown, which might have been just the paint of convenience for the Coast Guard at the time. We've received very, very favorable reviews on red gumball. A lot of, a lot of thumbs up, a lot of likes from all over. People stop us on the street, you know, and say, love the red, love the red. Uh, so far, so good. We hope to keep it as bright and brilliant as it is today. It looks amazing. I've seen seen photos since it was painted. It looks unbelievable. And I feel like I need to get back down there and get some new pictures because now my my photos yeah. are so so dated. It really yeah. looks like a new lighthouse. It looks like it was just built. The one thing I was wondering about uh, with the restoration is that the, the lighthouse at one time had a lower gallery roof and stanchions. That was all removed years ago. I forget exactly how many years ago that was removed, but uh, is there any thought to replacing those components? Yeah, so I think it was removed uh, when, when the Coast Guard panels were installed, I believe around 1980, Coast Guard's um, solar panels were, were very kind of tall. And so um, I, I believe that there was structural damage and Coast Guard, I assume, ultimately determined that it was it was easier just to just to take that down. We we constructed the caisson repairs to be able to to rebuild that uh, that that gallery deck at a later date. Now, at at the time, there was there was uh, it wasn't clear if Coast Guard could move their their panels and and where where they would be moved, and so. Yeah, so it, it wasn't an, an option to, to, to re-add the gallery roof at that time. But, but the, the, the restorations, which included um, this stainless steel band around the kind of upper caisson, it was built to be able to, to build that, that, that roof and, and, to, and to support that, that gallery roof. Oh, well, that'll be really amazing. That'll kind of be the, a finishing touch maybe if you can eventually get those those put back. Uh, yeah. So, so far, what would you say has been the biggest obstacle to restoration or moving forward? What do you see as the, the biggest obstacle? Uh, by far, the biggest obstacle, the biggest challenge has, has been the caisson. Yeah, I think, you know, I think, uh, you, you know, anyone with, with an offshore project kind of uh, figures out very quickly that it's very different than an on than an onshore restoration. It's a whole different, it's a whole different thing. And and getting workers out there and, and scheduling, uh, you know, you, you know, every kind of process needs to be very carefully planned because you know each each barge day is very expensive, and so you really it re you really need to be able to kind of coordinate and kind of get that get that uh, transportation and, uh, and, and, you know, all that stuff that, you know, on an onshore project, it's, it's not even a consideration. But, you know, for the offshore project, we probably spend 80% of the time just, just figuring out, that, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, so I think that that's something that, that is kind of just the, the inherent challenge, you know, with the offshore lighthouse restoration. So it was a lot of metal work. And, and uh, we brought in some very accomplished people from your neighborhood, Jeremy, North Point Marine, which is out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. They do a lot of work with, I think, Coast Guard and Navy, you know, repair work. They're, they're skilled, accomplished metal workers. And what we found, you know, was obviously a lot of patch stuff had to be done. And this is, you know, 1902 uh, cast iron. It's not like they're making this stuff uh, anymore. So as they, you know, their skills were definitely required in this. 
But as Alex has mentioned a couple times, not only the patches, but the bands, both at the upper level of the caisson and as far down to water level. We actually pulled, pulled back riprap to get as far down as we could, right? Because that is a 30 foot cast iron structure. And we got down, you know, almost halfway, you know, and, and there's a, a very strong 18 inch stainless steel band with hundreds of bolts that, that encircles the entire caisson. So it was patched and then preserve and rehabilitate in the name of restoration, because uh, just patching it is not enough. So we think we, with these bands that are uh, below and up top, and then some kind of girdles on two places that we've restored the integrity uh, of the caisson. But it did uh, uh, take a couple summers to do. Uh, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say that we are uh, behind schedule and over budget. Uh, but anybody working on a lighthouse would probably be familiar with those, you know, those terms. We, we are a little bit behind, and that was the case on. As Zach, Alex mentioned, this year, though, a lot of progress, you know, with the interior and the exterior paint and, and restoration, and now onto the systems, which starts in earnest next week. Well, I hope you don't feel at all bad about being uh, behind schedule and over budget because I, it's miraculous what you've, what you've done already. Believe me, I am so impressed. Thanks. So just to go back for, for a minute about the, um, the early history of the lighthouse, there was a very famous incident that I've actually written in my book on Connecticut lighthouses and a couple of articles I've written about this. There was a time in 19, 1910 when an assistant keeper named Leroy Lowborough was abandoned by the head keeper, John Kiarskin, for 11 days. He nearly, star Lowborough nearly, nearly starved to death. Uh, it's an incredible story. There's a lot more to it than what I just said, but I won't tell the whole story right now. But when you're at the lighthouse, do you find yourself thinking about that incident and, and in general about the lives of the keepers who live there? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the things that the family, my, my daughter's working on is, uh, it's getting a list, uh, which is not hard, of all the keepers, you know, that were manning the light. And she's actually started a project on one of the uh, gene genealogy sites, uh, trying to find relatives uh, of the keepers. Of course, the last man, uh, keeper, last keeper left in 1972, we're told that at, at its peak, there were three people manning the light, two assistants and one, and one senior. And one of our donors told a great story, uh, an elderly man who grew up in Rowayton. Uh, and he told a great story that uh, when he was a kid, he would uh, go out to the light and visit the keepers. He, he and his mother would bring pies and the keepers loved the pies. And, um, and he recalled vividly and this man is, I think, in his 80s at this point, you know, the, he recalled vividly the, 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 the layout. You know, he recalled that the galley on the first level, the assistant keeper's room, residence, if you will, on the second level, the, uh, the keeper's main room, then the watch room, and he recalled all this. And so as we embark, uh, oh, and he also said whenever the keepers were off watch, they would come by <laughs> They would come into uh, the Five Mile River in Rowayton and, and, and certainly pay a visit to his house and get some more of his mother's pot <laughs> uh, when they were off duty. Uh, but we've, we've kept this in mind in terms of the restoration. So we envision, you know, a galley on, on, on the first level, uh, an assistant keeper's bedroom on two, which will have a couple bunks, main keeper uh, on three, uh, or head keeper, quote unquote, watch room, uh, although every time we're out there, we kind of debate whether the watch room should be the keeper's residence and because it's such a beautiful, uh, particularly in its restored state with the porthole lights, it's such a beautiful room. But we always, we, we want to keep, we want to keep the tradition alive. That's what preservation is all about. It's history. It's living history that we've been able to help save for the community. And part of that is, is the keepers that were there. So we envision, you know, exhibits, uh, uh, the local historical society has a keeper's log from, from a period of time. We hope to be able to borrow that to display for tours. Uh, so we, we're constantly keeping that manned experience in mind as part of this restoration, because otherwise it would all be gone and it would just be memories. 
but now we, 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 we feel confident the light's gonna be standing, the tower will be standing for the next 100 years. And part of that is the memory you know, of the keepers that will stay with it. This is great. I just love, love hearing that kind of thing, that the human history is being very much taken into account. Yes. That's, that's great to hear. So let's move back to uh, what's happening lately or, you know, currently uh, a new LED optic was installed not long ago. It was, when was yeah, the it was actually installed last November, very, a very cold November day. <laughs> the, the Coast Guard came out there and it was actually a surprisingly long process because they, the new beacon couldn't be uh, couldn't match the characteristic of the old beacon, right? The old beacon was a was a one second on uh, eleven off, and so it was a it was a twenty four second cycle. And for whatever reason, this this uh, the the new LED beacon couldn't couldn't do that characteristic. And of course, you know the characteristic is you know noted in, in all the charts. Uh, and so Coast Guard had to uh, actually apply to the local commission or to the, and so it was actually changed. And so they, they actually had to, to change the characteristic. And of, so of the new LED of, uh, of, of the light pattern. And so it, it, it changed from a 10, 10, one or changed from an 11, one to a 10, one. Um, and it's, it's the same, uh, red, red, white pattern. So, um, and yeah, so it's, uh, uh, it seems to be working well, you know, I think what's what's nice about the the new beacon is that it actually turns on when it's still bright when it's still bright enough to kind of be out there, right? Because the old light, you know, it would only turn off when it was like pitch black, and so right, it's like you you could never kind of get those cool pictures of you know the, the light being on, but also kind of at sunset. I guess one one really nice thing about the about the new light is that is that yeah, it, it kind of turns on when it's when there's still people uh, kind of out there. And it, so it, it kind of adds to that, to that kind of true lighthouse uh, experience. And then of course the foghorn, same, it's the same old horn that we've seen for years, but of course, as you're probably aware, it's now boater activated. And uh, that, that, that's uh, the Coast Guard, uh, as you well know, is, is, uh, is pleased with that change. I, I will know that, you know, sometimes Alex and I are out there or a crew is out there working and somebody will turn on the horn for uh, fun, for fun. And, um, you know, there is a kill switch in the, uh, in the tower, which Coast Guard said, don't touch. But I must tell you that, you know, when there's a crew out there for eight hours, eight, nine, 10 hours that, uh, they need to turn that off. And then we turn it, you know, we reactivate before. Yeah. Leave. But so far, no incidents with the boater activated foghorn. Yeah. Well, that tends to be the case. Uh, I'm in here, here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, I almost never hear the the electronic horn in times of fog, but I hear it on sunny days when there's lots of boaters around, just like you're yeah. describing. It's like somebody with their VHF radio, you know, telling their friend, look what I can do with my radio. And they, That's exactly what yeah. we've experienced. Uh, we'd like to hear it more often in the fog, of course, there's no boaters <laughs> out <laughs> generally right. than, than on a bright, sunny Sunday afternoon. It's the same thing down here. Yeah. Well, I kind of think the, the fog signals in general are not used as much for navigation, uh, obviously, as they once were. But also, I think, the, to me, the lights uh, still have more importance, possibly, than the, the fog signals do. I don't know if you would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. So, but as far as the LED light goes, there's a different look to the LED lights. It's a colder type of light. It's an, the older uh, types of uh, lights were more had more of a warm feeling to them. Has there been any reaction of the community to the new LED light? You know, I think at at first, I think you know when when, when people you know heard it, it was changing over. I think that there was a, a little bit of uh, concern, but I think that. You know, from from shore, they're really it's it's hard to kind of tell any significant difference. Like the old light kind of had this kind of sweeping look to it, but but yeah, I mean, it, it would have, of course, as I said, it would turn on later. And so I think that the, the the fact that it kind of turns on when it's still sunset and you and you kind of get that experience, you know, I think that that more than offsets kind of the the, the kind of the kind of drawback 
in, in kind of losing that kind of sweeping pattern. Yep. Yeah, yeah, like the white itself is is a, a little bit of a of a cooler shade, but but yeah, it, it's it's not it's not super noticeable. I think unless you you were really kind of looking for it. One donor who lives on the shore did say to me a week or so ago, and you know we put this in our newsletters for a couple of years, but he did say, "What do, what did you do to the light? <laughs> what what do you mean?" He goes, "It's it's just kind of it just." It just has a different look to it. It's more of a flash. And I said to him, well, that's, you know, that's the LED. So it, re it, it really has to be kind of the trained eye, uh, not the casual observer, you know, that, that notices that LED difference. Let me ask uh, either or both of you, what do you think Green's Ledge Lighthouse, you've kind of touched on, on this to some degree already, but what do you think the lighthouse means to the local community? And part two of that question is, why does it need to be saved? Well, there was and still is a rich history of boating and shipping in this area. Now, Norwalk Harbor uh, saw, you know, 100 years ago, a fantastic level of commerce, uh, not unusual along the, uh, along the uh, Connecticut shore. A lot, and, and, and being in close proximity, we're 50 miles from New York City, a lot of that commerce, you know, into Norwalk Harbor, Bridgeport Harbor, and of course on up the Sound, you know, was kind of emanating from the metropolitan area of New York City. And so there is a rich coastal history to, uh, to Norwalk, Connecticut. Now, uh, less commerce, less commerce, you know, even the lobster men have moved away. And more and, and, and more pleasure boating, uh, a lot of pleasure boating, sailing and, 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 and the like. But the lighthouse, Green's Ledge, is a monument to that history of commerce uh, and boating, you know, that goes back to the 18th uh, century. And to lose that, uh, as so often happens with historical buildings that people take for granted, you know, to lose that, you lose that piece of history and, and then it's just a memory and that memory fades as generations pass. And so what we have felt from when we got started with this is that Green's Ledge will, the memory will not fade. It's going to be standing. It, we, you know, that's what we've set out to do. Before any, a drop of paint was applied, we wanted to make sure that this structure would not come down like Old Orchard and, and so many others. And so what, what it means to the community is a lot. And, I, and I've said often that it reflects on us as a community. Yes, there's a bright red and white beacon, but it reflects on us to see that standing and, and, um, and reflects positively on us as a community that we value our, our history. I mean, it all, it all kind of goes back to that the next hundred year vision, which is really just to kind of, just to kind of, uh, to, to keep that going. There were about 40 of these um, offshore caisson lighthouses built. I think there's 30 left. There's been like a half dozen of really good restorations. And I think that, you know, in, in researching this, you know, I think we kind of borrowed a lot of kind of the, those ideas from those other you know, half dozen really good restorations. We've spoken with a lot of the, the, the people that, 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 have, that have done those restorations. And, you know, like they all have, you know, stories and, and kind of what they did right and what, what seems to, to kind of work. And so I think that, that yeah, like we're definitely benefiting from, from, those, from those past kind of works. And I, I would add, Jeremy, part of, part of the history and, and, why it should be saved is you know, part of what I'm thinking, uh, and I know you would be uh, in favor of, is the next generation. You know, the, uh, our, our generation, I think, has done a, a great job of tackling these lighthouse projects, obviously via the, uh, the, the Lighthouse Act of 2000, where these were made available, you know, to private hands. Uh, but it re it's really up to the next generation to keep this going. And as you've probably and your listeners have probably already figured out Alex is my son and and I'm looking forward to Alex you know carrying that you know that tradition the lighthouse tradition onward 
And, and as our donors have come forward, many of them have said, gee, can, can, my, can my children be involved? And I'm like, absolutely, that's why we're doing this, so that your children are involved, not just looking at it, but you know, maintaining that preservation so that in another 100 years, when maybe it needs <laughs> a little work, it's, it's, there's, gonna be, there's gonna be a foundation upon which that can be done. That's mm -hmm. what it's all about. That's a great point that you as father and son in a way are representative of the passing of the torch to the next generation. We need young people to get, get involved, obviously, if uh, lighthouses are going to be saved for posterity. And I want to mention also that I, I grew up in uh, Lynn, Massachusetts, just north of Boston, and I lived in Winthrop, Mass. for about 15 years. And right near Winthrop, Mass. Is, was a case on spark plug light, the Deer Island Lighthouse, yes. uh, which in 1982 was in such rough shape that instead of preserving it, the Coast Guard dismantled it because they felt it was unsafe. And at the time, it was done all, so quickly that I think people didn't even really realize what was happening. So there was no chance to mount a preservation effort or anything like that. And the lighthouse was replaced by a fiberglass pole and eventually by an even uglier steel, nondescript steel tower that's there now, just a skelet, little skeletal tower. So uh, it's just fantastic that you guys have saved Green's Ledge Lighthouse from any kind of similar fate. So I wanted to, to throw that in. That, that's what can happen. Also, Duxbury Pier Light, otherwise known as Bug Light in Duxbury, Bug Light. Massachusetts, yeah. was another one that was saved. The Coast Guard was planning to demolish it and put up a, a fiberglass pole or something like that. So that took a, a citizens group to, to save it. Let me ask you before we wrap things up, how can people learn more uh, about what you're doing? How can they, and part two of that, how can they help with restoration? Yes, we're like, we're pretty active kind of posting kind of daily restoration uh, updates on our Facebook and our uh, Instagram, facebook.com uh, slash save greens ledge, uh, Instagram, I think it's the same, uh, Instagram uh, slash save greens ledge. It's also kind of uh, kind of uploaded to our website, which is safegreensledge.org. And in terms of uh, reaching out to getting involved, our uh, email and, and phone is on on the websites. So mm -hmm. we'd love to hear from people. There, there, there is a how to donate uh, tab uh, also on the website, and uh, and we'd love to hear from people that want want to help. You know, we've we've obviously we've got contractors, good ones. You know, with with the project right now. But once we're done, uh, we're going to need some help. You know, running this thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, we haven't done that. You know, I'm in the financial. We're we're both in the financial services business, not in the lighthouse business. So uh, we welcome people reaching out to us and offering their views on how it should be done in the future. Well, I don't know how to break it to you, but you are in the lighthouse business now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Very you're much right. So. You're, you're right. Increasingly more than uh, uh, just in, in off hours. So we welcome being in the business. I think it's probably like you have two full-time jobs. <laughs> yes. I have one final question. Again, either or both of you can take this, but this is for bonus points. Uh, what has been your favorite thing about your involvement with Green's Ledge Lighthouse? That's a great question. Uh, I'd say my, my favorite thing has been dealing with the community and the response from the community and meeting people that care about the community, about preservation. That's been, that's been my favorite thing. We were, we were a little nervous going into this. We were somewhat new to town. You know, we had lived uh, inland about 15 miles from here. Uh, moved down here in 2013 to be closer to the water and closer to boating. Um, you know, took on the took on the auction and and uh, you know Alex and I uh, talking about it after we won the auction and and other family members. We were a little nervous, you know, about how we were going to do this and how would the community did the community care? And the answer that we found was yes, absolutely. We cared enough to get it started and meeting people that have a similar, although maybe not as nerdy a passion in lighthouses that, that we have, and I say that with honor, you know, as a badge, uh, but nonetheless, meeting the people uh, that cared about the community and cared about preservation, that's been most gratifying to me. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think from the construction standpoint, you know, there, there, there have been so few of, of these kind of restorations done and, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all different. And, you know, every project kind of is, uh, requires kind of this creative kind of, kind of process to it, uh, right? It, it's, it's, cre- it's a creative process to try to figure out how to get the materials out there, how to get the workers out there, and kind of how to kind of do this, you know, in, in a way, that, you know, that nobody really knows 100% sure kind of what should be done, kind of how it should be done. And so it's kind of it's always this kind of continual kind of creative process of kind of going through different concepts and, and kind of trying to kind of work, work together to kind of, to kind of solve this, this bigger uh, issue. In addition to treasurer, Alex is pretty much the de facto project manager and has done a great job orchestrating those many, many different, some are big projects, some are smaller projects, but he does a great job at organizing them and get the, getting the creative thinking. How are we going to solve this problem? You know, because it is a mile offshore. It's not sitting, you know, sitting out here down the street. It's a mile offshore, and that's a whole netter, another set of issues, as many of your listeners are well aware. Well, Alex, that was really nicely said. It, it very much is a creative process. Every lighthouse is different. Uh, the things you, challenges you run into are going to be different. And uh, I'd say it's more of a, it's a science to some degree, but probably more of an art than a science. And uh, you guys are obviously up to the, the challenge. So I want to congratulate you on, on what's been accomplished. Uh, it, it is so impressive. And I can't wait to, to see, uh, you know, what happens in the next couple of years. It's uh, just uh, absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much, Alex Petty and Tim Petty, for spending this time with me today. And I hope we can talk again sometime. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Andrew J. Simso II was one of the Coast Guard keepers at Greens Ledge from 1943 to 1947. In 2011, his granddaughter, Sarah Di Maria, wrote to me about an incident where Andrew Simso and another Coast Guardsman went ashore to get supplies in February. The two men left the mainland to return to the lighthouse in the early evening. Here's what Sarah wrote. They attempted to follow a channel cut through the ice by another ship. Unfortunately, this was futile. My grandfather and his fellow sailor became trapped as the ice surrounded their small boat, leaving them stranded. In the pitch dark, the men yelled for help, but no one heard. They decided to try to walk back to shore on the frozen ice, but both men fell through into the frigid waters. The men managed to pull themselves out of the water and get back to the boat. The two, shivering and freezing wet, continued to yell for help. This time, people ashore, hearing their calls, contacted the authorities. The two men, on the verge of hypothermia, were rescued. Thank you to all the members, staff, and volunteers of the U.S. Lighthouse Society, its chapters, and affiliates. Check out uslhs.org and also Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to learn about everything the Society offers. Thanks to everyone everywhere who works to preserve lighthouses or any kind of history. We're all on the same team. As always, thanks for listening and keep a good light. Shine. Yeah.